Hey, good morning. How are you all today? The table did briefly scare me. I'll admit that. Uh, we're glad that you're here, and we're continuing on in a sermon series called Start. Last week, we talked about how in Jesus Christ, uh, we can have new life, a new beginning, a fresh start, a new way of living. We looked at the story of Jesus and Nicodemus found in John chapter 3 and talked about how he found out that you had to have new life, to be reborn, uh, to enter into the kingdom of God. And that's not an easy process. We have to give up our old life, our old ways of doing things. Uh, it's not uh, an easy thing because we think it's so important and so crucial that we always get our way or that we are successful. And yet Christ says, come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. My burden is light, my yoke is easy, and uh, come follow me. He invites us to come and follow him and to find new life. So if you just follow me for just a moment and, and ask the question, which is, well, what would the next step be? What would the next part of that person's life who has just made a commitment to follow Christ, has said, I want new life in Christ, I want to follow him, what would be the next best thing that they could do? And my contention, my belief is that they would begin to study the scriptures, that they would read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that they would begin to get an understanding of what the good news of Jesus Christ is and the gospel, and that they would find a group of people that they could study the Bible with. I think this is one of the greatest gifts that you and I have when it comes to the church is an opportunity to study the scriptures together. There was a wonderful pastor in Virginia, and he pointed out the fact that in his church, both Democrats and Republicans studied God's Word together. He said that alone should prove that miracles still happen, right? Uh, but it, it's such a gift when we have the opportunity to study God's Word and to be with other people uh, who have their perspective and their way of looking at things and their background, and you all gather together and you say, well, what does the Bible say about this? How do I begin to apply it to my life. It is such a beautiful gift, and like I said, if you are new to the faith, if you are new to Christianity, or you're trying it again for the first time, uh, there's really not much better that you could do for yourself than to study God's Word. It's like milk for an infant. It just continues to feed you and strengthen you and, and lead and guide your steps. Now, unfortunately, what I've found, found in my life and in my ministry is that Many times people have a hard time reading the Bible. They struggle with it. And it, it has to do usually with some things that they've been brought up with. Uh, it may be that they grew up in the church and then they went off to college and somewhere along the way some professor told them you can't trust the Bible. And even though they don't believe or remember anything else that professor taught, uh, that stuck with them, you know, and so they, they discounted it or quit reading the Bible. Or it may just be that they look at it and they go, that book is huge, it's long, and there's no way I'm never going to get through it. Uh, or it could be a, a number of other things as well, like could you trust the history of it? Uh, or what do you do with some of those passages in the Bible that are frankly offensive to people these days? You know, how do we even begin to deal with those? Now, just once again, I really love my Bible. It was not the case for that when I was growing up. I was probably like some of you. I looked at it and I said, that is a long book. I'll try and read it. You read it, what, Genesis, Exodus. Maybe you struggle your way through Leviticus. You get to Numbers and you think, there's other things that I could read, right? Uh, all these lists, all the begats, surely there's got to be something else that's more inspirational. And if you get to that place, what I encourage you to do is just to keep flipping along, right? and find something else to read in the Bible uh, and go back to that later on in life. Um, but uh, the more importantly, when we talk about the Bible, many times people will say, well, can you, can you trust the history that's there? Uh, can you believe that the accounts that are in the New Testament about Jesus and his resurrection, uh, are they historically accurate? You know, could you put those alongside something from that time and that day uh, thousands of years ago and say, you know, it, it looks like somebody wrote a historical account, or um, can, you, can you even begin to have a sense of that? And what I just want to point out to you real quick, if you've got your Bibles, you can open them up to uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, and I just want to read for you how Luke begins his, 
his gospel. He says, Many people have already applied themselves to the task of compiling an account of the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used what the original witnesses and servants of the word handed down to us. Now, after having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, I have also decided to write a carefully ordered account for you, most honorable Theophilus. I want you to have confidence in the soundness of the instructions you have received. And so when you look at that particular passage, I just want to point out to you that um, the scholarship that has been done by people like C.S. Lewis, they would say, if you were going to write something that wasn't supposed to be believed, if you're going to write a legend, if you're going to write a myth, if you're going to write poetry, you don't start that way. You know, you just begin with the story or you um, find another way to start. You don't start off with, I have done my utmost to give an accurate account of the information that was handed to me from people who were first-hand witnesses, right? And what is Luke saying? He's saying within 40 years of the resurrection, he's, he went out and he began to talk to people, and he said, tell me about your understanding of the resurrection. How did it happen? What, what were the events that, that go along with this? And within 40 years, he had gone around and he had talked to people. If you've ever read the stories in the Bible and you said, why is that person's name there? The exact reason is because Luke's saying, go, go find them. Go, go ask this person, and they'll tell you exactly what I've written down. And so when you talk about the history of the Bible, you're saying that, that Luke was among the other people, went out and got it firsthand, asked those people the questions of what it was, what happened, and uh, they wrote that down. And just to point out to you, many times people say, well, you know, somebody just wrote down and wrote a, a really good story. If you go back to the thousands of years that when Luke wrote this, there's nothing like this in terms of historical fiction, all right? If you love historical fiction, if you love Michener, uh, or whatever the case might be, there was not even close to being invented yet when Luke sat down and wrote these things down. Nobody had even come up with that idea. The other thing I want to point out to you in terms of historical accuracy, uh, you can flip over to Philippians chapter 2. And uh, every scholar points out the fact that what Paul does in chapter 2 is that he recites a song, a hymn. And the hymn goes something to the effect of, even though he was of the same substance of God, he humbled himself and came into the earth, that's Jesus, and humbled himself upon the cross. You know, and Paul is quoting a song, and he's doing that within 15 years of the events of the resurrection. Okay. And so when it comes to, is it historically accurate? Did he, did he get the story right? I think with all confidence, you can say, absolutely. Yeah, he certainly did. And you might argue with me and say, well, um, what about the Old Testament? You know, all the stories in the Old Testament, are they all accurate? And can you really prove them historically? And I would say, keep coming back to Wesley, and we'll eventually get to that. <laughs> all right. But we've got other things we've got to do this morning. Um, so... I think history, you know, can you trust its historicity? Can you trust that it's historically accurate? Uh, I think that's something that most people are willing to, to give ground on, right? If you're dealing with somebody who's not a Christian, they'll, they'll probably go along with you on that. Um, and, you know, they also, when you talk with them about the Bible, they're willing to uh, even acknowledge that there's some things in the Bible that uh, if they were if you were going to write a story, a fictitious, a fictitious story, if you're going to try and make up something that you could use to trick people, that there's pieces of that gospel message that just don't fit. Jesus' baptism, why does somebody who is without sin be baptized for the remission and the forgiveness of sin? There's not a historian out there, the most diehard atheist historian out there would even say, certainly Jesus' baptism happened. Um, and then you put alongside that, that if you're trying to trick people, if you're trying to make up a story, you wouldn't include the accounts of the disciples. You, you wouldn't put them in there if you were one of the leaders of the early church because if you were trying to manipulate people or trick them, you wouldn't have stories like Judas betraying Jesus. You wouldn't have accounts of Peter denying Jesus. Uh, you wouldn't include the ways in which the disciples just over and over again missed the point, right? Instead, you would say, the disciples did everything right, everything went well for them, and Jesus was well pleased with them, or something like that, in order to use that to manipulate people. You wouldn't include those. And then for me, really, the, the linchpin, the key piece of, you know, what would you put in there, or, or what you would not include, I would say that the, the main piece there is that 
when Jesus is resurrected, who is it that gets the news first? It's women. And no offense, but in that day and time, if there was one group of people that were not credible or believable, it was the women, right? And you would not put them as the ones that carry the message of good news of the resurrection to the disciples early on. You, you would pick somebody else. You would certainly pick a man, right? Not today, because women are awesome, right? But then, you would never do that. And so those, those being included just gives it such a, a depth and a credibility that I think is important. But even if you do those two things, I think there's still a piece to it that most people, if you and I were to have coffee with them and talk with them, and you would say, well, you know, what's your problem with the Bible? Uh, why don't you trust it? Why don't you believe it? Probably the number one thing that they would say is that there are pieces in the New Testament, there are passages in the New Testament that are just frankly offensive today. That they would lift up to you the issues of human sexuality, uh, they would talk about the issues of slavery that are listed in the Bible. You would talk about how uh, things like women submitting to their husband. Uh, you would talk about miracles or things like that. And you would say, they're, they're so, so offensive. And they would say, haven't we moved on? Can't we just move on from there? Why do we need to include them? Or can't we just kind of pick and choose? You know, they would say, I like some of the stories, but I don't like this. So why can't I just pick and choose what's there and um, not really worry a whole lot about that? And what I want to point out to you is that, you know, when we begin to make decisions like that, when we begin to say that, you know, we will adhere, we'll trust uh, one of Jesus' teachings, but some of the stuff that we find in Paul's letters or some of Jesus' teachings we find offensive, so we're going to ignore those, uh, we are participating in a great deal of cultural blindness. And what I mean by that is that, just for example, in, in our culture, probably one of the, the verses that is quoted even by people that don't go to church is, judge not, lest you be judged in the same way, right? Don't judge. Don't judge other people, which is understandable. Nobody likes to be judged. If we've been judged, we know how painful it is. And so the only people we can judge is those people that are judgy, right? That joke will work next week. All right. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we say, you know, judge not, yes, lest you be judged. And then we like Jesus' teaching on forgiveness, you know, forgive your enemies, pray for them. Uh, but when it comes to our culture, we don't like the, the way the Bible talks about marriage. Um, and when I say we, I'm just saying in general. Uh, we don't like the way that it talks about marriage. We don't like the way it talks about human sexuality, that there are restrictions on what we do with our bodies and, and what's appropriate and what, what is godly, right? Uh, but if you were to take those two same issues and take them to someplace like the Middle East, and you talk with them and you say, hey, what, what do you think about Jesus' teachings on uh, divorce and marriage and, and human sexuality? They might say something to the effect of, he's too easy on it right? It's too lax. And then you say, well, what do you think about forgiving your enemies and not judging them? They would say, that's ridiculous. Have you met my enemies, right? Why would I ever forgive them? Do you understand what I'm getting to? I'm saying that we view the Bible and the things that Jesus speaks from our cultural perspective, and we have to be ever so cautious when we begin to say these things are no longer relevant or that we should move on from there. Because what makes sense for us in our American culture is not going to be the same thing that makes sense to somebody in another country or that somebody that has lived before us. And just to kind of emphasize what I'm saying, y'all all realize that if you are lucky enough to have great grandkids, that if they were to go back and read your letters and your thoughts and your diaries and your journals or hear some of your conversations, there is going to be at least one thing that they look at and they go, that is silly. Can you believe they believe that? They ate margarine. Who does that, right? <laughs> Have you seen some of the pictures of their wardrobe, right? Who wears a lime green leisure suit? Nobody. Parachute pants. What were they thinking, right? You know, 
go on down the list, and, and you're going to find something that they would look at and go, oh, that's just ridiculous. And so I would just say, just be ever so cautious when you decide that you know better than what Jesus does, and you declare that you can pick and choose which of the things that he taught are worthy of your time and your effort. Because sooner or later, you know, culture changes, lives change, but what we find in the Bible is this beautiful plan of salvation, this beautiful way of living our lives that not only redeems our life, but redeems the whole world, changes the whole world. Okay. Well, so what? Well, um, is, I, I love C.S. Lewis' quote. He said, it's one thing to take a piece of rope and say, that looks like a good piece of rope. It's a whole other thing to take that piece of rope and say, I'm going to use this to climb down the edge of a mountain, right? It's one thing to say it's good. It's another to trust it. And so what I want to do for you is, uh, if you will have your Bibles, I invite you to open them up to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30. And um, if you've got your phones, you can follow along there too. But uh, Moses gets to the end of a really long sermon. Uh, this whole book of Deuteronomy is Moses preaching. And so about this point, people are beginning to wonder, what am I going to eat at Luby's? Um, it's a long sermon. Uh, but he gets to the end of it and he says, uh, this commandment that I'm giving you right now is definitely not too difficult for you. It isn't unreachable. It isn't up in heaven somewhere so that you have to ask what will go up for us to heaven to get it, for us that we can hear it and, and to, to do it. Nor is it across the ocean somewhere so that you have to ask who will cross the ocean for us and, and give it for us that we can hear it and do it. Not at all. The word is very close to you. It's in your mouth and in your heart waiting for you to do it. Look here, today I've set before you life, what's good versus death, what's wrong. If you obey the Lord's God's commands that I'm commanding you right now by loving the Lord your God, by walking in His ways, and by keeping His commandments, His regulations, and His case laws, then you will live and thrive, and the, the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you refuse to listen, and so are misled, worshiping other gods and serving them, I'm telling you right now that you will definitely die. You will not prolong your life on the fertile land that you are crossing the Jordan River to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth as my witnesses against you right now. I have set life and death, blessing and curse before you. Now choose life, and that you and your descendants will live. By loving the Lord your God, by obeying His voice, and by clinging to them, that's how you will survive and live long on the fertile land the Lord's given to your ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so what is Moses getting at in this passage? He's saying, everything that you need for salvation, everything that you need to live your life in a way that is filled with God's blessing, everything that you need in order to be a part of what God is doing in the world, he's saying, it's all right here. It's all right here before you. And Moses was talking about God's law and his interpretation of it. But what I just want to point to you is that in the Bible, we have everything that we need to grow and to gain our salvation and to have our world transformed in a powerful and a beautiful way. And when we talk about this particular passage, what does Moses say? He says, it's not too hard. It's, it's not too difficult. Even if you hate reading, I'm, I can guarantee you, you can listen to the Scriptures on something like Audible, Right? I mean, I've been at this so long that I remember the early sermons I did. You can get the New Testament on a cassette tape, right? And now I'm like, you can find it on Audible. You can download it. I don't know what the future will be. Click somewhere in your mind, and it will appear, right? You can find ways to, to read and study the Scripture on a daily basis. It's right here. It's right evident. And, and what else does Moses call them to do? He says, make a choice. Make a decision. You know, one of the great things that we find in our salvation is that God gives us the ability to choose good, to choose God. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do the things that please God and that show our love for God. And that Moses says, choose. You know, are you going to live a life that brings about blessings in your life, or are you going to live one that's, that's far from God? 
He says, you've got great direction on how to live for God. It's right here in the Bible. You can follow it. It will teach you. It will guide you. It will be a light upon your feet. It will it'll take you to places you never imagined in your discipleship. So, but you do have to make that choice. Will you read it? Will you follow it? So in the new year, many of you, one of your goals, or, or maybe one of your goals has been to, to try and be healthier, to maybe lose weight. I remember a couple of years back, I decided to do the same thing, and I uh, paid money for a meal plan. And the meal plan was great. It had the, the wonderful directions of every other meal plan, which is eat lean meat, veggies, and stay away from fats, right? Are they really all that different? Okay. And um, it said that, you know, if you follow the prescription, if you do what's required here, then, then you will lose weight. And sure enough, I tried it for a month, and I dropped weight. It was successful. And I got to the end of about a month, and I thought to myself, this particular diet is great, but I absolutely love bread, right? And I, the diet allows for bread, but not the amount of bread that I believe should be eaten, right? And that um, I told myself, you know, he may be right, maybe I am losing weight, maybe it's working, but, but bread, you know? I need more sandwiches in my life, and certainly pizza cannot be all that bad for you. What's the result? I stopped losing weight, right? And when I think about God's commandments, we can argue with God, we can deny it, we can struggle with it, we can dismiss it, we can say, uh, no, it, possibly, it can't possibly be right for us, or we can apply it, we can test it. We could put it to use, and we can watch and see what God can do. So I encourage you, I invite you, study His Word, read your Bibles, begin to learn it, find a group of people that you can journey along with and, and share in that with others as well. It will change your heart, it will change your life, and it will bless you. Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, we delight in you. We thank you that you have given us the scriptures, and uh, we even thank you for those passages that confuse us and uh, upset us and cause us to wonder and to shake our heads because...